So good afternoon. Welcome to this presentation about scripting Apache OpenOffice. If you have questions while the presentation is going on, please uh, interrupt me and step forward. Uh, I have about uh, 85 slides, so you can imagine that this is a quite uh, comprehensive uh, introduction on how to program script OpenOffice. Um, but the slides are created in a way that once you got the first part of the presentation, you will be able to understand it on your own also. So there is no need for me, if you have questions, to hurry up to get through all the slides. Okay? So it, the purpose of the slides is also to document it and to allow you to look up uh, different possibilities later on and transcribe um, the natural examples to your programming language. Okay, this is the plan. Uh, first, an overview, a bird eyes overview of the architecture of Apache OpenOffice. Uh, then we concentrate on scripting, programming uh, Apache OpenOffice. Um, uh, how is this in principle being done? And then there are quite a few nutshell examples, little programs that are runnable and do something useful. Um, as it meant as a stepping stone and um, helping interested programmers uh, to approach uh, the word processor of OpenOffice, the spreadsheet or the presentation module and um, interact with it programmatically. A little roundup and there are links at the end to various areas of um, programming OpenOffice. Now, let's start first with uh, the bird eyes view of uh, OpenOffice. OpenOffice is a set of services that may contain interfaces with attributes, other services, structures, or properties. So this is a very generic, abstract definition, but it uh, really describes what OpenOffice is all about. Um, what is also interesting, uh, there is a true object-oriented design applied uh, to all of OpenOffice. Um, which means that all common functionality of all types of documents is extracted and organized as a set of interfaces that define methods and possibly attributes. So for instance, loading, saving, printing documents are specific functions, functionalities that could be extracted and then grouped together in so-called interfaces. Um, what is also important from a bird eyes view, services are created and get managed by service managers that are supplied with OpenOffice. Um, the next thing which might be interesting is that OpenOffice is a client server uh, application and communicates via TCP IP. So um, it employs distributable components in principle um, uh, where we have an acron acronym to which I come back in a minute called UNO. UNO um, well, I come back in a minute. Server can run on any computer in the world, the open office server part, and the client may be even on a different computer on the other side of the world, and it would work. Okay. Um, it just happens to be the case that if you install open office, that the server and the client part are installed on the same machine which is interesting. Um, okay, UNO is the acronym for Universal uh, Network Objects. It's a distributable interconnected infrastructure and the functionality is organized in the form of classes. They are also dubbed UNO classes. Um, one interesting part here is that all UNO classes are documented in their structure in an, um, in an interface description language, actually originally in a text file. Okay. Um, the communication among UNO objects and UNO components is carried out with a so-called UNO remote protocol um, using TCP IP as the, as the, as the transport and it's a Korba-like um, um, protocol. So if you look from the distance at OpenOffice, OpenOffice documents, uh, you'll see that uh, OpenOffice is, is in the middle and you have all kind of documents that OpenOffice is able to read, create, edit. OpenOffice itself is uh, originally a C++ application, but then when Sun bought StarOffice, the original creator of, Open, uh, of OpenOffice, um, all of OpenOffice was also um, um, made available to Java via a Java bridge. 
team, which uh, caused uh, quite a few uh, Java components to be created later on that became part of OpenOffice itself. So OpenOffice is a combination of C++ and uh, Java code. Um, now, the gen generic term for UNO objects could be UNO components, which may uh, combine different services, for instance. And they may um, communicate with each other. You have a server, you have a client, and they are able to communicate via uh, this um, UNO remote protocol. Um, Object-oriented design, there are UNO components that got defined and implemented. Uh, and what actually uh, happens from a conceptual point of view, you pick UNO components and combine them to create an application like the word processor. Okay? The, word processor uh, the word processor's name in OpenOffice is SWriter. Um, now, if you pick another combination of UNO components, you may create, for instance, a spreadsheet. And if you look at different UNO components of the same color, uh, then here's the attempt to, to communicate that it may be possible that, that the same components are being used in different applications of OpenOffice. Which also means if you learn one of uh, the functionality of one of those UNO components in the word processor part, for instance, you already know how to use the very same component in the spreadsheet application or in the presentation application which is quite uh, an interesting feature. Okay, Paradise View next uh, service managers, also sometimes dubbed factories in the different documentations uh, available for OpenOffice. Uh, service managers are supplied by servers, um, and you can usually get at a service manager uh, by um, using the component context that is being created by OpenOffice and querying it uh, or in this case, invoking a method that will return you the service manager. Uh, service managers are used uh, to request or create services. And uh, the return services, which are normal objects, allow you to access part of the office functionality. For instance, there is a service called com.sun.star.frame.desktop, which is a service. Uh, you have com.sun.star.configuration configuration configuration provider, which would be another service. Um, what you can see already is that you would have uh, fully qualified, you would have package names, and the fully qualified name of a UNO class uh, looks as, in this particular case, uh, as you are used to maybe from Java. Okay? Uh, so the unqualified name of these uh, UNO classes representing services would be desktop, configuration provider, database context. Uh, from the documentation of OpenOffice, you have this, um, uh, this uh, picture of a service manager being a factory, which can be used to create all kinds of services. Services can be very comprehensive. They may contain interfaces. Interfaces are a group of methods uh, and attributes. Other services and properties. Um, OpenOffice was created at a time where uh, memory and bandwidth was very, very low. So um, there are many very efficient implementations and interesting architectural um, um, rules that have been applied. Uh, one is if you get a service object, you may not yet use all of the functionality of that service object. Rather, in, a, in, a, in an intermediate step, you need to query uh, the interface that contains the functionality, the methods that you wish to use and take advantage of. So you would always have and constantly have the need to do query interfaces on service objects in order to get at the group of functionality that you wish to use uh, and take advantage of. Um, Depending on the desired task, the interfaces could be, for instance, uh, com.sun.star.u.xprintable. Uh, the unqualified names are easier to, uh, to communicate, so you would have xprintable, xstorable, xtext document. Uh, it's a convention in OpenOffice that interface classes uh, always, the unqualified name starts with a capital X. It's not a must but it's been carried through throughout um, OpenOffice implementations. 
So Xprintable obviously will organize the functionality, the functions, the methods for printing, storable for saving, uh, Xtext document, the interface uh, functionality to get at the text of a document. Um, here's a little example of um, a bird eyes example of two services with seven interfaces uh, that um, st this picture stems that follows from the um, documentation of the open office uh, development uh, toolkit and communication. And you see that we have an office document, which is this class here having four interfaces. And you have a text document with three interfaces. Now, from uh, this notation, you will see that a text document specializes an office document. Uh, meaning that a text document, of course, via inheritance, will uh, have all these abilities available to it as well. Now, if you look at the office document, you see you have the Xprintable, the Xstorable, uh, the Xstorable, the Xmodel, and the Xmodifiable uh, interfaces. So, if you look at the Xprintable, I read it um, here. It, you have a method called getPrinter, setPrinter, and print. So there are only three functions there, but these three functions are available for all applications of OpenOffice, and they are actually quite powerful. You can configure whatever you wish to print, uh, supplying proper, um, collections of properties as an argument. That's the reason why it's um, only necessary to supply these uh, three um, functions. Storable has obviously to do uh, with storage of documents. X model is interesting because it indicates that uh, the user interface in OpenOffice follows the model view uh, controller paradigm that was introduced originally with Smalltalk many decades ago, but has been so successful that it has been deployed uh, all over um, object-oriented um, infrastructures. Okay, now if you look at the text document, you see we have an interface X text document, which interestingly only possesses uh, two methods. One is get text and one is reformat. Now one needs to be a little bit cautious because get text does not uh, return uh, the characters uh, representing the document but represents other objects that can then be used uh, to further drill down or manipulate text. Okay, um, okay you will have um, an X-searchable and an X-refreshable interface. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to this uh, interface up here in the Office document called X-modifiable, which has um, two methods. One is is-modified, so you can learn about the state of any document in OpenOffice because the Office document will always be the superclass for word processors, for spreadsheets, for drawing documents, or for presentation documents. So if you wish to learn whether a document was edited, then you would um, first query the xmodifiable interface and then use the, the method isModified, returning true or false. Now, if you programmatically created a, a, a document, uh, for whatever reasons, it may be uh, sometimes interesting to throw the document away. But if you close the document, which is modified, you will get an interactive pop-up uh, dialog uh, querying the user whether the user uh, really wants to throw this away because the document was modified. So this is the other uh, method that helps you in this case, set modified. And you can supply true or false and actually tell OpenOffice, pretend the document is not modified because closing it afterwards uh, does not cause this dialog to appear. I'm stressing this so much because I have experienced in the past that many people are seeking this uh, functionality. They saw it, but then they forgot about it because uh, they were drowned in, in the functionalities that OpenOffice supplies. And then they get into serious troubles. And actually, if you know where to look, it's easy. So I hope by stressing it so much that you will never, ever forget it and never lose time there. OK. Um, the programming languages that you can use to program um, OpenOffice are C++, of course, because that's a language which was used to create it in the first place, Java. 
There is a basic language uh, that comes with OpenOffice, uh, and there is Python, uh, support for Python out of the box. C++ and Java uh, have uh, the need to explicitly use a, uh, a method called query interface to get at the functionality that are to organize in those interfaces. Basic and Python have an implicit query interface behind the curtain, if you wish. So it is carried out, but uh, the programmers have no need to carry it out explicitly. In, uh, in OpenOffice 3.0, a Java-based scripting framework got introduced, which in principle enables uh, the addition of any scripting language that adheres to this Java framework. Um, for instance, BeanShell is you and, the, and the Java implementation of JavaScript are using this framework. And this framework can be used for any scripting language, even for non-Java scripting languages. So for, here's an example where you have uh, a scripting language which is usually unknown and unheard of called OREX, uh, which itself um, needs uh, query interfaces to be explicitly issued, but it's being bound uh, to um, OpenOffice and then made available as a macro language using this Java-based scripting framework. And you can do it with any language, actually. You just need to know that this infrastructure is there. Okay, um, what is extremely important in OpenOffice programming is the documentation of OpenOffice. There's a wealth of services and interfaces that are available to you. I'm not a German, I'm an Austrian, so I may say that uh, the entire OpenOffice was created in pure German engineering style. So what they learned in the textbooks, they would apply really uh, to real world um, situations. And they did a beautiful job in creating object-oriented classes. Um, however, there's a downside to this, that because of the rich functionality of an office package like OpenOffice, you have an unbelievable amount of classes that are available such that, it, that you might run the risk to miss the forest for the trees because there is an overwhelming amount of classes functionality available to you. For that reason, documentation is so important. Um, here you have the links which link you directly to the official open office documentation, which is a set of HTML, interlinked HTML files, uh, comparable to Java docs, if you wish. And if you know the entry points, how to get there, then it's rather easy to find your ways around. So here is uh, an example of um, the official um, documentation for all of the open office classes. And on the top, you will have a little bar where you have, among other things, a link to the index. If you click that link, you get um, a little bar with all the alphabetical letters. And if you click on the X there, you get um, to see to the, all the links uh, to terms, fields, uh, classes that start with an X. And if you know that the open office interfaces usually start with an X, then you have a path here to quickly find the documentation to any interface in open office. Okay. It, interestingly, not too many people realize that, and so they lose a lot of time if, if they do it the hard way, if you wish. But uh, this is hopefully a, um, a, a hint that will save you a lot of time if you look at it. Now, on this slide, you will see um, examples of applying this query, inter query interface um, call to query an interface uh, from a service object. Your query interface is always from service objects. In this example, we have uh, a service uh, object of this type, uh, com.sun.star.frame.dispatchhelper, and assigned to a variable named sdispatchhelper, s indicating service. In, inter in Java, you would um, exercise the query interface this way with this um, uh, service object. You import um, the interface class, which is a Java class available if you develop with Java. And then you carry out uh, a, a query interface using um, an object uh, class called Uno Runtime, 
where you supply the, the interface class object as the first argument, and as the second argument, um, the service object itself. And what gets returned um, is an object which has now the, the functionality made available to you that this interface class defines. Okay? Because it's a strictly typed language, you need uh, to cast uh, such that uh, everything in the compiler, everyone is happy. Um, here's an example in how you would carry out the query interface in JavaScript. You import uh, the xDispatch helper class and you use the UNO runtime as in Java to query the interface, uh, the desired interface from the service object. Um, here you see an example in, in a scripting language that is called OREX. Um, the thing on the, in this example is you have uh, the service object and you send it the message and the message name is the name of the interface class. Now, the tilde here that you see is an explicit message operator with object rex. I just uh, mention it because all the examples, you will see that for yourself, look like pseudocode, but are in the O rex syntax. And if you know that the tilde is a message operator, you can decipher those programs and then translate what uh, these programs do easily to Java, C++, Python, BASIC. Okay? Um, there is a simpler way in the OREX um, support. You are, you, are, you are able to just supply the unqualified name of the interface um, such that you can also use S Dispatch Helper, Twiddle, X Dispatch Helper, and then you get the interface object back. Uh, in principle, there are two different ways how to program Apache uh, OpenOffice um, standalone from outside your OpenOffice. So what you need to do in this case is you need to bootstrap OpenOffice, um, the infrastructure, such that you can then get in touch uh, with that infrastructure to control it later on. Um, this kind of uh, programming OpenOffice allows you also to easily uh, determine with which OpenOffice servers you wish to contact and to which, which ones you need, want to use. And the second one is uh, the one that um, is uh, dispatched from the inside of a running open office, which is uh, many times also called macro, a macro uh, program that you dispatch from within open office. So in this case, open office supplies a script context that allows you to access uh, the initialized open office environment, uh, like the desktop object, which is a very important object for documents get component, um, the context uh, information object that uh, is in effect, and the document for which the dispatch has occurred, such that you can address also uh, the document in your script. Now, this is uh, the bo a bootstrapping example in Java. You would need to have, of course, all the import statements uh, in the beginning such that it is able to successfully compile. And the first thing what you would do is you would use uh, the bootstrap class to create an initial component context, uh, which is the context that you carry along uh, for interacting with um, OpenOffice. Using the local context, um, you can qu uh, query now the service manager that you will be then using in this case uh, for creating services. One service in this example is the uh, service you know, URL resolver. That's a class that allows us later on to um, resolve an open office server supplying a URL. Um, okay, before we can use this services um, functionality, we must do a query interface. Supplying the XUNO ult resolver class uh, such that we are then able to uh, supply an argument like this. You, re you, you get access to the resolve method. The resolve method expects uh, an argument. And the argument looks like um, uh, you have the protocol part, you all know before the first column, and then you have information following it that, dep that depend on the protocol that is being in use. So here you see uh, that the host you uh, that uh, you wish to talk to is the local host. If you have an IP address, it can be any host in the world. The port, the protocol, uh, and uh, the service object that you wish to have access to initially 
uh, at the server side. So you check whether the initial object could be fetched, and if it's available, you can then uh, keep on using this uh, um, service object, in this case the service manager, uh, which in your program will be a proxy for the service manager in the server. Okay. This is the same example now with the OREC support um, where you would um, be able to use a predefined routine. With the, this is the support. There's special support for open office uh, programming and there's one routine called uno.connect. Now, one, another hint here, in Rex, the dot is a normal character, okay? So uh, it's like a letter or whatever, um, but, but it looks familiar somehow because the dot has been used in so many programming languages. But I just wanted to point out that this is, uh, there's a little difference there. But this is actually all you need to do to um, create an open office uh, server and get in touch with it, okay? So this is a little bit smaller, of course, than the Java solution because all the logic that needs to be carried out is done in this routine. But it's made easier on the programmer. And here you have an example uh, in uh, OREX where you have another routine that is being used uh, which creates the desktop object. And uh, there's a fixed sequence of statements that you have to repeatedly use in order to create a desktop. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, what happens is that from the desktop object, you query the X component loader interface. You have a string uh, which contains, again, a URI, a URI, URI, private protocol, factory slash as writer. And uh, from the component loader, you exercise the method load component from URL and supply uh, this URI. Here, the next argument, underscore blank, tells uh, OpenOffice to create a new window. It's uh, like if it was in a browser, underscore blank. I keep forgetting the third argument, and the fourth argument uh, is, a, is an array of OpenOffice property value objects. And many times, um, you can, you, you, well, if there's time at the end, I could speak, uh, tell a little bit more about it. But what is uh, interesting is um, there are some methods in OpenOffice where you cannot use null if you have no property values arrays. Rather, you need to supply an array of property values with a capacity with a size of zero. Okay? And because it's um, used or uh, needed uh, quite a few times in different areas of OpenOffice, the, the REC support supplies uh, by default, uh, an empty array of type property value, which is just being fetched here from all racks and supplied them. This is the code that is needed to create an empty word processor document, okay. which is easy enough if you, if you saw it and, and uh, see it. But there's more to that. If you changed in this string after this slash, the module from SWriter to SCALC, you will create an empty spreadsheet document. Uh, the same here in the uh, presentation. The presentation module is called SImpress, um, and there's a draw module called SDraw. They all start with S because the original name of the company was Star. Okay, so that, that's the reason why. But there's another thing which might be uh, surprising. This URI could be such a uh, URI. Could, this is a local file URI. This is an HTTP URI. You could work with WebDAV, for instance. And you would even be able uh, to use the FTP protocol. And you have the rights to, to save that. You would be even able to save those documents. And again, it's, uh, uh, it's ingenious for me. I'm not affiliated with the developers. <laughs> how easy this was made available just by using the concept of the URI. Okay, and now we turn to the different kinds of um, um, editors, if you wish, the word processor followed by the spreadsheet and by, by the presentation one. So we now concentrate and enter the world how to program uh, the word processor of OpenOffice. 
Uh, first thing is you need to realize um, the functionality that is available. Uh, and the word processor consists of three services. Services, uh, there can be multiple services implemented in one object in OpenOffice, okay? Uh, there's um, a generic text document, an office document, and a text document service. <clears throat> All these services are fully documented on uh, the internet. Uh, so if you follow the documentation URL, you, you can get at that documentation. There are altogether 35 interfaces available. Um, and they, these are the unqualified names. And if you look at the names, you see the functionality that is actually available at the top level. If you have a function that returns a UNO object, you may have a different uh, service object or interface object in your hands, adding, uh, making it uh, possible for you to even use uh, additional functionalities. Uh, one very important interface, of course, for word processors, uh, word processor documents, is the XText document interface, which allows you to address then uh, interact with this document as a, as a word processor document. There are 37 three uh, properties uh, defined. Um, I forgot to mention at uh, explaining the services. The properties, if a service has properties, then it's always a set of properties. So you need to get an interface to access the collection of properties that are available, for instance. It has also the interesting ramification that sometimes properties may be uh, documented to be optional and actually not available, depending on the context where you fetch the service object. And that's possible because the properties of a service are managed a, as a collection. Okay? And uh, here we have 37 properties. One is highlighted, the character count property, because it's being used uh, in one of the examples to show you how easy it is actually to, to, to get at the properties and take advantage of it. Okay. Uh, the major interface, once you created a document, is the XText document. Uh, it, ha it will make available the, 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 the method, the function getText, which returns an XText object, meaning it's an instance of the UNO class um, named XText. The XText is derived from the XSimpleText interface, so via inheritance, all the functions, uh, the functionality that is defined in XSimpleText is available, which itself is de uh, derived from the XRange text. So that functionality is available as well. The word processor has the notion, the concepts of cursors available to it. So you have different types of cursors, for instance, paragraph cursors, sentences, words, characters, page cursors. And if you query, the, if you get access to the cursors, you can step through the entire document paragraph-wise, sentence-wise, words-wise, characters-wise, or page-wise even. Okay. Um, it is always possible to insert tables, fields, pictures, drawings, other objects into an X-text uh, object. Now, the first example is about creating a word processor document and adding the text, Hello Apache on North America 2013. Closing the word processor document manually will call the save dialog to appear because creating that document and putting text to it will modify the document. Uh, this is um, the, the code. You need to get the desktop object. From the desktop object, you query the X component loader, which you need to create an empty word processor document. Okay, it's a word processor document because we use here SWriter. Uh, everything else is the same as beforehand. What is added here is that the document that you get is being queried for its XText document interface, which then enables you to use the method getText. Okay? Um, and the result is an XText object. The XText object is an XText, uh, and, and now this uh, cumbersome sounding explanation comes into play. 
X text is the specialization of X simple text, the specialization for X range text, such that all methods that are defined in these interfaces are now available. Among other things, a method called setString. And here you supply the string that should be um, set at that position in the uh, word processor. And here you see the result. It's a, it's a, a writer um, document, in this uh, example from the Macintosh. And the content of this document is, Hello ApacheCon, North America 2013. And that's actually not difficult if you saw what sequences of query interfaces you need to carry out. Um, the next example um, uses the X modifiable interface to turn off the modified flag. And then it, it exercises the X closable interface to close the document. And if the document is not modified, you can immediately close it. Otherwise, this pop up dialog would appear modified. Uh, okay. So, this is um, the, the first statements are exactly the same as beforehand. What is new are these, these three statements. You query from the document the X modifiable interface. Get access, therefore, to the set modified uh, method and supply um, the false value as an uh, argument to clear uh, the modified flag. Then, uh, in this example, if I were to run this, uh, I have all the examples on my machine, I could run them. The, system, uh, the, the execution would sleep for five seconds, and then using the exclusively interface, the document would get closed, and the document would be uh, uh, done after that. OK. Now, this example adds um, code to show the property character count of the, of the, of the word processor service object. Um, most of this is the same as beforehand, except for the code here in the middle. Um, what you see here, docTwiddle X property set queries the interface called X property set from the um, document service. And now you have a set of, of properties available uh, to you. And the X property set interface defines, among other things, a method called get property value. Supplying the name of the property. Uh, will return the value that is uh, currently stored with this uh, property value. And in this example, the output would be, because there is an output operation here to the uh, command line interface, would uh, show you character count, colon, space, um, 25. 25 comes from the get property value character count. So this will return the number 25. If you have any questions, please interrupt me again. Um, I just will proceed in this space uh, because then uh, we will be able to truly get through all the slides, which would be a premiere, actually. <laughs> okay, so the next example um, demonstrates how to select words using a word cursor in a text document, replace the text with a different text, and then apply uh, different formatting at the replacement text, making it red, and changing the font to a, to a déjà vu somono font type. Okay? So uh, what happens here is we get the desktop object, we get the X component loader interface, we use now the load component from all method to create a new word processor, an empty one. Then um, we use the xText document interface and then the method from this interface uh, named getText and use that uh, object to, uh, to set a text to it. Hello, ApacheCon North America 2013. So the same document would be created as beforehand, but now we keep on working. We change the second word um, and the third word. To do this, we use the xText uh, object, uh, and it has, among other things, a method which is documented called createTextCursor. Okay. 
Um, now we have a text cursor. We go to the start of the text. And the argument is either false or true. Um, if it's false, then no selections will be done. If it's set to true, then the movement of the cursor will cause selections in the text. Okay? So here we go to the beginning. We move the cursor to the beginning of the text. We select nothing. Then we use the X text cursor to get uh, the X text cursor to get its interface called X word cursor. So we have now the, an X word cursor and can step through the document wor word wise, ahead and, and backwards. So what we do here is uh, go to next word and uh, with the argument false, moves to the second word of the text, but does not select the word that was being moved over. And these two statements here select uh, the, uh, the following uh, words and selecting them, including uh, the blank that follow the, the text. And finally, the X word cursor is now used to set a new value, and everything that is selected will be now replaced by, by the new text, which is actually straightforward if you, if, you, if, you, if you get used to this logic. And the next thing now is the selection still exists, and what happens now is um, we, uh, from the X-word cursor, we, we query the X-property set interface, which allows you to access the properties and the properties would be the properties of the selected text. So in this case, the character color is uh, set to red, such that the, that the replacement text will now be red. And here you see how you change uh, the font. You just um, uh, use again the X property set interface from the X word cursor, and uh, use that property value, the character font name will be changed to déjà son mono. Okay? So um, this would be the resulting document. So the second and third um, uh, uh, word would have been replaced. This is now red and in déjà vu son mono. And the, the cursor would be there, which is Times New Roman. But this is déjà vu son mono. And I think the, these are, um, if you get to that logic in open office, it's straightforward and actually not complicated. Okay? Now, um, here there is another um, um, de demonstration of how to use the word processor. Uh, we create um, paragraphs, multiple paragraphs, that have uh, different adjustments. Right, adjust, uh, right adjusted, center adjusted, block adjustment, left adjusted. So first, the code looks like uh, the initial code. We create a word processor, we set a certain text to the word processor, now the next um, uh, code will allow us uh, to do this magic that we are about to demonstrate. First, we get a, a text cursor. From the text cursor, we uh, query the X paragraph cursor interface. So we now have the ability to address all the text uh, as, a, as a paragraph cursor and query the X property set interface from it. Uh, for this example, there is a control character, the paragraph break character that we wish to use. So we use the open office uh, class com.sun.star.text.control character. And from that, um, we query the paragraph underscore break value, which is some number that will be returned that we then insert and have a paragraph break effect. Uh, the other thing is um, the UNO uh, type system has not only constants, which is uh, visible here, but also enumeration values. And enumeration values in this case are paragraph adjust enumeration values, which we wish to access. <clears throat> now here is some code, there is an array defined with the, uh, with the values right, center, block, left, which are the verbs which are needed to be used to, um, to uh, right, center, block, or left align a paragraph in this example. Then what you see here is a loop over those um, values. Uh, we use the text cursor to go to the end of the existing text. Okay? 
Nothing is, uh, um, is selected. Then we insert uh, a paragraph break. Okay, this is this control character. We do not select anything. Then we define a string and... Um, okay, I have 15 minutes left. I have my alarm here. <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, what we have here is ADJ, which would be right on the next loop center block and left, such that the text contains uh, the alignment information. And then we use the insert string function of the xText object to, uh, at the text cursor to uh, insert the string. And the string is copied eight times. That's a, that's a Rex function. So whatever your programming language uh, will have, use it. Uh, so it's eight times this sentence. Um, and you see the last argument is true, meaning whatever gets inserted will be selected. Okay. And now the, the paragraph properties come into play and the property value named para adjust um, is, uh, is set to either right, center, block, or left. But um, this is from the, va the value that is being used is from the UNO enumeration. Okay? So the UNO enumeration has right, center, block, left to it, and this is being queried here. So running this four times yields finally this output. You have first Hello Apache Con North America 2013. We have the right adjusted uh, paragraph. We have um, the center adjusted one, you see it here. Here you have the block uh, adjusted paragraph and here you have the left aligned one. Okay, So that's once you, you know the plumbing and how they interrelate, it's not very difficult. And that's the purpose of the nutshell examples. To arrive at that know-how may be taking you days and weeks. And that's always the, the benefit of nutshell examples that they jumpstart you. Okay, that's the reason why I always appreciate working nutshell examples. And to transfer it to your language, to map it, it should be easy because the code looks really like pseudocode. And if you know the query interfaces that need to be carried out, you are really very, very fast up, uh, up and running. We now turn to the spreadsheet uh, module, three services. Again, office document. But then we have the spreadsheet document and spreadsheet document settings. So these three um, uh, service classes define a spreadsheet. There are 26 interfaces. The most important one is the X spreadsheet document such that you can get at the functionality that is specific for spreadsheets. There are 40 properties uh, currently that are defined for spreadsheets which are just uh, documented here. Um, from, uh, from a bird eye's view, uh, a spreadsheet um, is an is a spreadsheet document which contains a collection of spreadsheets. Um, usually, you would be able to numerically um, address individual spreadsheets, um, zero based, if you use the interface X index access. OpenOffice is quite flexible. It also has, for instance, an interface to not use a number to address spreadsheets, but names if they have names. Then the interface would, have the, uh, would be named X name access. Okay? So when you, once you see that or learn that, it's, it's straightforward again. Um, spreadsheets implement the concept of a table consisting of a collection of rows, which, which each have columns. There is an, a cell range, Excel range interface, a tabular area of a spreadsheet. Um, and uh, the or or origin of uh, 0, 0, uh, represents the upper left-hand corner. So uh, these are actually offsets relative to, to the upper left-hand corner. Addressing a cell um, can be carried out numerically. Get cell by position would be the method that you use. Column offset, row offset, and this uh, method will return a X cell, a cell object, which contains a value of a formula maybe and may have properties such that you are able to individually format it. Um, it's also possible to refer to cells or regions by name, a named range or a column, a name, one base, A2 is for instance a representation that is quite common and uh, everyone would know that. 
So what you would do in this case, you, get, you use the function get cell range by name, supply the name, and you get an X cell range back, even if you supply the name A2. So if you want to get at the cell, you need to, you need to apply the get cell by position method and supply 0, 0, the left upper hand corner. Okay? Uh, it's possible in spreadsheets to insert charts, drawings, and so forth. Here's an example of um, how you would create a, an empty spreadsheet and put this text into A1. Um, to create the document, you just change the type from S writer to S card. So now you have a document which actually is a spreadsheet. Uh, to work with it as a spreadsheet, you query the interface X spreadsheet document. Then you have access to the method get sheets. And then you query the interface X index access such that the returned objects allows you to address every spreadsheet with a numeric index, which is being exercised here. Get by index zero gives you the first spreadsheet. And from that spreadsheet, you query the X spreadsheet interface functionality. So now you have, this, you have the spreadsheet with the spreadsheet functionality. The next thing is um, <clears throat> with get cell by position 0, 0, you get uh, the first X cell. And there you use the method set formula to set it to a text. Okay. Um, here, the example also shows you how you would uh, be able to save that document that you just created. Um, you need to uh, use uh, the file URL. So the OREC support has routines implemented that ease this to translate it to the correct file URL, uh, to the native operating system representation, vice versa. You would use the extorable interface from the document and then get access to the store as URL uh, method, and then you supply this file URL. Uh, the second argument, again, is an empty array of, proper, of type property value. You could, for instance, supply passwords, make it read on whatever. You just need to further study the documentation and natural examples. So the, there's a lot of power even in that corner, which we don't have the time to go into detail. Um, and then you use the exclusable interface to close this saved document. Uh, this would be the result. You would be able to create with this code an empty spreadsheet, set the value to the cell A1, save that um, spreadsheet in a file. The next example demonstrates how to change the height of table rows. So what you'll do is you create a spreadsheet. Um, you add uh, the uh, text uh, to A1. And now you use from the spreadsheet the interface x column row range, and then the method get rows. Now you have all the rows available uh, that are in the spreadsheet. And here uh, is a little loop. Uh, don't forget um, the, the indexing by number is always zero based. But this loop goes from 1 to 5, so it's uh, referring to row 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And what happens is, uh, from the x rows, notice the s, uh, collection, you uh, fetch um, the second row here on the first loop. Uh, you get access to the property set. Um, you query the current height of a row, which returns a number. Then, which is the old height, the old height now gets increased by the value of the counter times 250. 250 is uh, um, 0, 0,25 centimeters. The coordinates in OpenOffice are metric. Okay. So this will uh, increase in, the, in this example the height by a quarter of a centimeter. Um, then you set the property height to the new value, and uh, you set the, the, uh, a cell in that row to uh, a value which tells us the old height value and the new one. Okay? And uh, this is then placed in the spreadsheet. If you run this program, you see um, you, you have uh, these rows that increasingly become higher. Okay? And the next example does the same with columns. Okay, so um, you, 
you use the x column row range, it will get columns um, function. So with this interface, you also have a method called get columns, which gives you, which returns you, thank you, which returns you um, um, the collection of columns available in the spreadsheet. And then the same logic is applied here, except that the width is changed. Okay? There's a property named width, which is being used to clear the old width, change um, to a new width. The new width will be uh, reduced by a quarter of a centimeter per thing. So if you look at this uh, spreadsheet, you see that the columns get smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? Good. Now we have another example here where we create a spreadsheet document um, and I think we end with the spreadsheet examples because we only have four minutes left. Uh, but if you have questions, they would be available afterwards um, and we could go through uh, the missing slides if you, if you wanted to. I'm also around tomorrow so you can always approach me if you want to. Okay, so create a text, a spreadsheet document, a text and a date, and demonstrate how to format individual cells and the cell range. Okay, you, you create the spreadsheet, get access to the first spreadsheet. Now, in, in the REC support, they, there are also routines supplied that make it easy to query or set individual cells. Behind the curtain, all those interface, query interfacing takes place. So there are different, there's a name, John Doe, date, and today. Today is a formula from OpenOffice. So you have the equal sign, today, uh, the name of the building function in OpenOffice, round parentheses. And the next thing is um, uh, we form a different cells. B1 um, gets um, uh, a certain background color that is determined here. Uh, in B2, you um, change the character color to a different color. And here you uh, change the boldness of uh, the text. Character weight is the name of the property value. Okay. Um, if you look at the result, you have the different coloring and the different boldnesses applied to individual cells. So the formatting is done with property values. Um, the next one is interesting because it shows you um, how to create a chart in an open office spreadsheet. So in this example, we have uh, four quarters that get created automatically for 2011 and 12. Um, the, the column headings will be formatted, the numbers will be formatted in a certain way. And then a chart will be created from this um, data. The numbers are being created uh, randomly. So here we create the spreadsheet. Here we create the different headings, A1, B1, C1. Then there is a little loop, one through four, meaning the different quarters. And you see with the, the random function is a built-in function, in this case from Rex, where, where you supply the range. So the, the line title is Q, uh, concatenated with one, two, three, four, and then uh, we have different random numbers. Now, here you define a cell range by name, A1 through C1. We, we take a look then at the resulting spreadsheet. Uh, query the property set interface um, and uh, change these properties in the character way to bold. So column A, uh, the, the cell range A1 through C1 will be bolded. Um, here you have B2 through C5, which will be two columns containing numbers. These numbers will be changed to the number format number four. They are predefined formats. Number four has the formatting that you see over here. Okay. Um, the next page now, sh so, so this is the first step. Then the second step, uh, this is the last example which I would bring to end. Um, and the next uh, page shows you how to create um, the chart. First, you use uh, the rectangle class. Um, you create an instance of the rectangle class. Uh, that's the X position, the Y position in the spreadsheet. Again, it's metric. 300 means uh, the X offset is uh, 0, 0,3 centimeters. Okay. The width would be 16 centimeters and the height would be 8 centimeters. 
So this is now an object which contains this information about a rectangle position and size. The next thing you'll do is um, you, um, you select, you, you get the cell range which contains the data that should be transformed into a chart. This is what you would do here. Um, you would uh, query the Excel range addressable interface to get uh, to this method and, uh, and assign the result to this variable. Um, this is a, a Rex ver uh, variant to create a Java array with two, uh, with, of this type with one element, which, um, which is a range address. From the X sheet, you uh, query the X table chart supplier interface to get access to the method getCharts, which returns you an empty collection of charts for this spreadsheet. Um, and you can use that to add a new chart. So add new by name, first char chart, you have here the rectangle, the address, and so forth. And this is the result, which is actually spectacular. Okay? And it's quite easy um, if you um, um, if you know, uh, if, if, you, if, if you have the how-tos to change the type of uh, the chart to make it three-dimensional and looking even more spectacular. So I jump now to the end. Okay, let's go further in. <coughs> Okay, um, what you learned now was a, a bird eyes view of the UNO framework. Uh, it's a very powerful framework, but also complex because there are so many classes defined. But it's not surprising the functionality is enormous that OpenOffice comes with. Um, you, can, you saw how to create edit documents uh, in SWriter SCALC. You will be able, if you look up the missing natural examples, to understand what SDRAW and SIMPRESS uh, will do. And you will be able, with the knowledge here, to transliterate it to your programming language, whatever it is. Okay? Um, there is a need for many more natural examples in all programming languages for OpenOffice. So if you are interested in this and you learn OpenOffice programming, think also about creating such little natural examples and share them with the community. That would be really a, a big, big help. Okay, so this concludes it. If you have any questions, please ask them. But maybe if you want to go for the beer first, uh, <laughs> we can meet back later at 8 or whenever. <laughs> so.